Our family uh, often walks the path over at Sycamore Shoals. It's a chance for our kids to burn off energy and throw rocks into the river. And one of their favorite places to go on the path is the playground. And if you've been on the path, you know it's not really a playground. It's just a place to do pull-ups and sit-ups. And our daughter, she loves to climb and hang on anything she can find. So she climbs up on the pull-up bars to see how long she can hold on. And I actually have a video of her very first attempt. We'll see if we can get it going. Just walk. No, you're good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now I realize that doesn't make me look like a great dad. Uh, you, you, you have. You might be able to hear. Her. She says, "I'm falling. I'm falling." I say, "No, you're good." And the video ended with me running after her as she was falling. Um, let's just say I didn't get there in time. All right. That's all you all need to know. Um, as I was typing this message, I thought back to that video and my daughter holding on with all her strength. And while that, that moment for her was, was something minimal, we often face things in life that are not. We're trying to hold on and to keep going, but the trials of life, they seem to be loosening our grips where we're trying to stay positive, but the struggles can seem so discouraging. We want to hold on tight, but if we're honest, it does feel like we're falling. So my hope is that we look to the scriptures in these moments. Trials will come. Suffering will happen. And how do we hold on tightly to the hope that we have in Christ without feeling like we're falling? So we're going to start in the book of James, if you haven't figured that out. This morning there's a new series called Steadfast Faith. It's really just a study of the book of James, the entire book of James that should take us uh, into no November. So if you have your... Uh, Bible, I'll be in James 1. If you have a digital Bible, uh, I'll be ESV. And if you have the notes, all of the main passages will be on the notes this morning. Uh, but before we study, let, let's pray together. Father, we, we ask that you would uh, teach us something. God, we're not, we're not here to have some emotional experience. God, we're not here just to feel good about ourselves. God, we're here to hear from you, to be an encouragement to each other. So God, teach us through your word. God, teach me, Father, teach me these, these words this morning. As they come out of my mouth, help, help, them, help me just apply them to myself. So we humbly come before your word and that you would have your way. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. I'm going to start in James 1, chapter 1, verse 1. Here's what it says. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Now we find two obvious realities that will set us up in verse 1. Looking at the author around A.D. 45 through 49, we have this letter from a man named James. Now last week I mentioned in the inner circle of Jesus that we saw in Matthew 26. We see Peter and the sons of Zebedee, James and John. That is not the James that we find in this letter. This James became one of the pillars of the early church in Jerusalem. This James is the half-brother of Jesus. This James did not believe Jesus was anything special for quite some time. So during the ministry of Jesus, his brothers were pressuring him to go public with his miracle ministry. So if their brother was something supernatural, well, then the world should know about it. So look at John 7. This is starting in verse 1. And after this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because of the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now, the Jews' feast of booze was at hand, and, while it, and so his brother said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. And if you do these things, show yourself to the world. 
And then verse 5 says, for not even his brothers believed in him. So Jesus said, my time has not come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I'm not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. So we have James and the other brothers. They didn't believe in him. So how did we go from this skeptic brother to leader of the Jerusalem church writing this letter? 1 Corinthians chapter 7, starting in verse 3, it says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 other brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. In verse 7 it says, then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. So James, the brother of Jesus, he witnessed the resurrected Christ. That's how. Like if people are saying that my brother is the son of God, I'm certainly thinking my brother is just a little bit crazy. But if people are saying my brother is the son of God and then he dies and he comes back to life, well, that, that actually might change my position. So James, he's this changed man because he's witnessed Jesus, his glorified body. Whether it was an immediate change or a gradual change, we do not know. But James was forever changed. So much so that he writes in verse 1 of James chapter 1. I'm a slave to God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I love that. It's not just some name drop from James. Jesus was his Lord. James, Jesus wasn't just some brother. He was servant. Servant to Jesus. Spend the rest of his life in service to King Jesus. That's who writing, is writing this letter, a, a brother changed by the resurrected Christ. But secondly, we also find out who James is writing to. So the text says, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. And it's highly likely that James is writing to these Jewish Christians that have been scattered due to the persecution of the Apostle Paul, formerly known as Saul, before he was converted. So this is what Acts 8 says, right after Saul approves of the execution of Stephen. Acts 8, 1, it says, And Saul approved of his execution, and there arose on that eight day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So it seems fitting that James, one of the pastors of the church in Jerusalem, would write a letter to his congregation that had been scattered over the region. And to be honest, I feel that one right now. Our church, like every church in America, has come under serious difficulties. We're experiencing a trial at East River Park like the American church has never seen. So I've got people spread out in different services. I've got people spread out in homes. They'll watch this on Facebook or YouTube. I've got people spread out listening to this on our podcast. I've got people spread out that have completely checked out on any form of church life. They aren't reading their Bible. They're not connecting with believers at all. And so I feel, I feel this letter from James. I'm confident you'll feel his words this morning as well. So here it is. This is James, brother Jesus, writing to scattered Jewish Christians across the region. And here's what he says in verse 2. James chapter 1, starting in verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And we'll stop because we begin with some very strange wording here in the text. James wants us to have joy when we meet trials. 
And those sound like two opposing words, if we're honest. Like, how are we supposed to have joy when we meet trials? Does James want us to be happy when life hurts? Are we supposed to be happy when we're sick? Are we supposed to be happy when we're struggling financially? Are we supposed to be happy when we get bad news from the doctor? And the reason we mess this verse up so much is we think that James is attaching an emotion to a situation. So we think James wants us to like feel a certain way when we go through certain things, but that's not the reality of the text. So James is saying he wants us to think and act in a certain way when we go through incredibly difficult times. Specifically, James wants us to think as steadfast, rock solid, committed, content Christ followers, regardless if the world is punching us in the mouth right now. That's what James is telling his congregation that is scattered across the region, and that's what I'm telling East River Park that's scattered across the Tri-Cities. We see joy explained as this passage goes on. It's a joy. It's rooted in faith that produces a steadfastness, that produces a fully mature Christ follower. That's what this series will be about. A series about a steadfast faith that produces mature followers of Christ. And we'll see that as a pattern week after week in this letter. James is showing us what it means to be a mature follower of Christ Jesus. But I want to clarify that word steadfast before we continue. Steadfast does not mean complacent. And steadfast does not mean that believers do nothing. Steadfast means that we are anchored in our faith in Christ and then we are moving forward toward Christ regardless of the trials that you're facing right now. And according to verse 2, we are steadfast regardless of our various trials, meaning this message, it's for you. This is written for you. Whether your trial is addiction, anger, greed, lust, your trial is financial instability, which we'll see in the text, whether your trial is health issues, whether your trial is believing the lie that you don't really have any trials. Regardless of your various trial this morning, how can we as believers in Christ stay steadfast? How do believers stay steadfast in trials? And that's the question James will answer from the text. We'll start in verse 5 and and read the rest for this morning. Verse 5 of James chapter 1, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask from God, who gives generously to all those who, without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and the rich in his humil humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away, for the sun rises with its scorching heat, and it withers the grass, and its flower falls, and its beauty perishes, so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his own pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he stands, when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. And let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is, is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. And then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, brings forth death. So do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. How do we, as believers, stay, fed, stay steadfast in trials? Number one in your notes is this. We hold fast to wisdom from God in faith. We hold fast to wisdom from God in faith. 
James says in verse 5, he says, if, it, if any of you lack wisdom, let's be honest, most of us lack wisdom. Like you can turn on the news for 10 seconds and realize that most people are lacking wisdom. So James is saying, if we lack wisdom, we should ask God for it with faith and without doubting, and he will give it to us. But let's be clear what we're actually asking from God. We are not asking from God for more knowledge or special knowledge. So on my phone, I have right here, I got on my phone, I have access to more knowledge than at any point in human history. So the problem is not more information. We're not asking God to download information into our brains about the future, nor are we asking God for some special revelation of what to do next. So wisdom is not waiting for a sign from God. We are asking God for wisdom to know what is right according to his word that he's already given us. And more specifically, we're asking God for wisdom to do the right thing when life is dis difficult or when we face various trials. Let me tell you what I mean. It's not easy to raise kids. And so when I, I'm praying for wisdom from God to raise my children, I'm praying that I would do the right thing for their spiritual development, even if that decision is not the easy one. For some of you, it's not easy to work in an environment where it feels like you're the only person that's really serious about following Christ. So when you pray for wisdom from God, you are praying that you would do the right thing, even if it's not the popular thing. And it would be easy for these Jewish Christians to give up on Christianity so they could go back to the simple life that didn't involve them being scattered across the region. But James is asking them to pray for wisdom from God to do the right thing. Even if those, those right things are difficult in the midst of your trial. So knowledge, it just stays in your head, but wisdom, it produces obedience through truth. So we are holding fast to wisdom from God and faith. It is his wisdom that we seek when the boat of life is rocking. And James, he has a contrast in the text. He says, someone that is doubting wisdom from God is like someone thrown into the ocean, being tossed around by the wind. They won't receive the wisdom of God because they're a double-minded man, a double-minded person. We know people like this. We have acted like this. What do you do when you're dealing with a specific difficulty in your life? I'll tell you what I do. Um, I, ask, I ask Google. I'm going to be honest with you, okay? I ask Google, how do you deal with anxiety? How do you lead a church during a pandemic? How do you pay off student loans? How do you manage stubborn kids? And it's not that we can't seek outside help. There's plenty of biblical support for that. But when we're going through difficult times, we should first pray to God for wisdom, not our own, or what Google says. So if you're going through a difficult trial this morning, read your Bible and ask God for wisdom to know what is the right thing to do according to the Bible. And when you ask for that wisdom, don't doubt that he will give it to you. God will give generously wisdom to those who ask in faith and without doubt. Maybe you need to change something this morning. Maybe you need to start something or stop something. Maybe you need to keep doing what you're doing, but whatever it is, let it be rooted in Scripture and confirmed by the wisdom of God. So we hold fast, not to our own knowledge, but to the wisdom of God revealed in his word as we face various trials. And here's point two. Number two is this. We hold fast to humbleness in light of eternity. We hold fast to humbleness in light of eternity. In verses 9 through 10, we have this contrast from James. He says, so the lowly brother and the rich. So James, he's first speaking about believers, which, he, which is why he calls this lowly one the actual brother and not the rich one. But what's weird is, is he's saying that the lowly brother boasts in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation. Now that makes no sense from our earthly perspective. Because poor folk, let's be real, don't have a ton to brag about. 
and rich people and always bragging about fancy clothes or cars or houses and vacations. And I've heard it said, I'm heard, heard, sure you've heard it said, money can't buy happiness. Which is dumb because money can definitely make people happy. Money buys a lot of happiness. Okay, that's just what rich people say when they don't want to sound rich. But remember, James, he's speaking to some scattered believers that are most certainly had their financial means rocked by persecution. It's hard to make a decent living when no one wants to hire you because of your faith or you're sent miles from your hometown. So James, he's writing to some financially lowly brothers and sisters in Christ and is reminding them where their true wealth is found in eternity. Their exaltation isn't how many dollar signs are found in their bank account, but their inheritance in Christ. And likewise, the unbelieving rich person will be humiliated at the final judgment that comes with eternity. Now, I had this friend this last week. He texted me um, over a, a frustrating situation that happened to him. And he, he confessed that he was just so mad. He was angry that the wicked always seemed to prosper. And I get it. Like it makes, it makes me angry when I see how many people that aren't following Christ, but it seems like they're just crushing it in this world. Like can't we just get a little, a little something here? Have more money and comforts than I could ever dream to have in this life. They have all of what the world offers and they aren't following Jesus. And James is saying, look, you can have everything this world has to offer, but you're still going to die. And the man with the most toys still dies. Just like a flower in the grass, he will pass away, and the sun rises, and the heat burns, and the wind blows. That's what will happen to the rich man that spent his life pursuing the things of this life, so stay humble. Being lowly doesn't mean that we must stay poor. James isn't saying Christians can't have money. James is saying, whether you have a lot of money or no money, you won't live forever. Stay humble. Pursue Christ. If you're in the middle of a financial trial, it's good to keep your eyes on eternity more than your money. And the humble brother, he's pursuing Christ, not cash, and will receive an eternal inheritance. We boast what will come in a hundred years from now, not not next year. Quoted this a lot, but it's uh, 2 Corinthians 4.17 for this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Stay humble. It helps us in trial in two ways. I'll just give you two sayings that you can think through as you go through trials. And this is just extra, here it is. Uh, something you say to yourself is, I don't need all that. I don't need all that. Okay, I don't need what this world offers, because what this world offers does not last. I don't need perfect health, or riches, or popularity. I need Christ in the middle of this trial. I don't need all that. Secondly, this won't last forever. Something to say to yourself, this won't last forever. This trial will not last forever. This difficulty and this pain and this hardship will one day stop. Every storm has an end date. Whether it's in this life or the life to come. And so the rich man, he pursues only what this world offers. And he will fade away. But the lonely brother who pursues Christ, even in the darkest times of life, will receive an eternal inheritance. So when you are faced with various trials, stay humble and look to Christ and see your struggle through the lens of eternity. Three, hold fast to the love of God over sin. Hold fast to the love of God over sin. Verse 12, James calls it a blessing to be steadfast in their trials. And within the context of these verses, this trial that he's talking about is clearly sin. So if we continue to stand the test of our sin, we will receive this crown of life. And we hear this language all over the Bible in Philippians 3, starting in verse 13. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies 
behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, and I press on toward the goal of the prize of upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. The next one in 1 Peter 5, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. 2 Timothy 4 says, I have fought the good fight, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith. Hence, therefore, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So the promise of this unfading glory is given to those who love God above all things. That's how we stand against the test of sin. And I referenced this verse out of J- these verses out of James last week when we talked about temptation, that God does not tempt, nor is he able to be tempted. We are tempted when we are suckered by our own fleshly desires. And the scary warning that we see in the text is that those desires give birth to sin, and sin, when it becomes fully grown, brings forth eternal death. So how do we stand against the trials of our sin is love God more than your own desires. Love God more than your own desires. It's that complicated and that simple. Love God more than anything else. Let me put it this way. Sin is not the test that we struggle with. Sin is not the test you struggle with. It's love. If you are fighting a specific trial of sin without love for God, you will either fail miserably or you will have a temporary victory that makes you self-righteous and neither option points you to a crown of glory. So hold fast to your love for God over sin. This is Matthew 22, starting verse 36. It says, Teacher, asking Jesus here, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. The first and greatest commandment is not a thou shall not. The first and greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. So how do believers Stay steadfast in trials. We hold fast to our love of God over our own desires that bring forth sin that eventually brings death. So love God more than anything else in your life. Lastly, number four. Hold fast to the word of truth. Hold fast to the word of truth. We're looking at verses 16 through 18. James is saying that we should not be deceived. And I'm thinking, deceived what? Like, what are we supposed to not be deceived of? Well, deceived into thinking that there is good in this world apart from God. So James, he's telling this to a bunch of Jewish Christians that are experiencing life that doesn't feel so good. I grew up in a church culture that said, God is good, And then you say, some of y'all got that. And then I say all the time, and you say, but understanding that through the lens of various trials, is God good when the innocent die? Is God good when you lose your job? Think that there's kids right now Laying in hospital beds with terminal cancer, is God still good? Is God good when you love Jesus and then some guy named Saul comes killing people you know and then kicks you out of your own hometown? Is God still good when the various trials you face don't feel good? And the answer is yes. So maybe in the middle of trials, you don't yell back, God is good, but you're able to whisper it. You're able to hold on to it. The point is, God does not give his children evil gifts, but good and perfect gifts. He's the father of lights, creator of stars and galaxies. He has no variation. He has no change. So in the middle of our suffering, God is the only thing that stays the same. 
it says in the text, by his own will, not ours, that's not what the Bible says. We submit our theology to what the verse says. His, his, by his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures, his prized possession, his offering among creation. By default, as humans, we usually don't like change. Things in our church have changed and will continue to change. And that's a good thing, and some of you all will struggle with it. We don't like when things are different. Even more so in our, our current culture where things have constantly changed and they've not always felt good. School plans change, work plans change. Like we even had a, a church pool party scheduled this afternoon. Uh, that's canceled. Didn't think it was that responsible to be throwing a big pool party right now. So much has changed, it's exhausting. And I just want to go to a concert and eat food without people judging me. Various trials have a way of shaking up our reality, and you get to feel a portion of what these Jewish Christians felt, which is why James is clear. Regardless of what moves around us, God won't move. He brought us into existence by his word of truth, and he brought us into salvation by the word of truth, which is why we'll stay steadfast by clinging to his word of truth. So hold fast to your Bible. Read your Bible. Seriously. If you want to stand fast, to stand strong when various troubles come your way, hold on to your Bible. This word will not change. His word will speak truth in the middle of your opinions. His word will speak truth in the foundation for which you can stand on. So how do believers stay steadfast in trials? We hold fast to the word of truth. Paul Schneider, he was a member of the Confessing Church. So it was a group of uh, pastors that would not bow to Nazi Germany, but confessed allegiance to Christ. And so his preaching of the Bible, it didn't sit so well with the local authorities. In 1935, he was arrested by the Gestapo. And in 1937, he became prisoner number 2491 in the Buchenwald concentration camp. He would spend his last 18 months of life in confinement would, where he would not stop leading, because he would not stop leading devotions in the barracks. Schneider, he told a camp official, there's no spot on me that has not been beaten black and blue. They sent dogs on him, they beat him with bull whips, they fed him a regular diet of a cardiac depressant drug, which eventually, with a huge overdose, killed him. And they gave his wife, Margaret, 24 hours to collect the body, nailing his coffin shut so that she could not see what he had suffered. Despite heavy observation, Observance by the Nazi official Schneider's funeral attracted hundreds of confessing church pastors and served as a rallying point for their boldness and proclamation. Sometime before he died, Schneider wrote, Certainly we still live in this world with suffering people and also share its sufferings, but we have a commission and a calling from another world, and our citizenship is there. We know that in spite of everything, this world will one day be victorious. Therefore, we will be cheerful in tribulation. How do believers stay steadfast in trials? We hold fast to wisdom, hold fast to humbleness and light of eternity, hold fast to the love of God over sin, hold fast to the word of truth. And then Tim Keller, I'll end with this. He put it this way. While other world views lead us to sit in the midst of life's joys, foreseeing the coming sorrows, 
Christianity empowers its people to sit in the midst of this world's sorrows, tasting the coming joy. So count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the conviction that it has, God. We all go through trials. Many of us deep in trials right now of various kinds. Whether it's money issues, whether it's family issues, Father, whether it's health issues, maybe it's a sin issue. God, we, we pray that we would hold fast to you, knowing that you're holding fast to us. So I just pray encouragement, Father, for brothers and sisters in Christ that are here, and brothers and sisters in Christ that are not here to stay steadfast. And we pray these things in your Son's name. Amen.